Am I the best husband in the world? Definitely not. But I'm a hell of a lot closer to the best than I am to the worst, I can tell you that. I've never abused my wife in any way. I listen to her. I communicate fairly well. I'm rarely argumentative. I have never and would never cheat on her. Our sex life is reasonable, and I'm financially successful. Yet Amy, my wife, has issues with me. Primarily that I work a lot. And she's correct, that is my biggest fault as far as our marriage goes. It's not uncommon for me to get up in the morning, leave for work, and not return home until close to bedtime. Weekends can get busy for me too if I allow it, but I always make sure that I take one full weekend day off to spend with my wife. Her argument is that it's not enough. I explained to her early in our relationship that I was a workaholic and my spare time was limited, and she was okay with that. We dated for over a year before we got married, and I reminded her before we took our wedding vows that my schedule would remain the same, but she insisted she was fine with that. Five years later, things have changed. My lack of time with her has taken its toll. Amy has become increasingly vocal about it. She says that she is lonely. I suppose that is why she has taken a lover. That's right, she's been unfaithful. The signs had been there the past few months. I noticed she was going out more often and making an effort to look especially attractive. She had been purchasing expensive undergarments but wasn't wearing them in my presence. I noticed her texting on her phone much more than normal. Occasionally, when I had extra time during the day, I'd try to reach out to her to see if she wanted to have lunch, but she would be unreachable. I hired a private detective and he confirmed my suspicion. Amy was having an affair with her co-worker, Joel. They would get a hotel on their lunch breaks, typically on Mondays and Fridays. They'd have dinner together every Wednesday evening, and then go back to his place. It was around this time that I started having grueling lower abdominal cramps accompanied by paralyzing chest pains. It felt as though I were being stabbed with thousands of pins and needles. This was all brought on by stress, no doubt. I stewed as I contemplated what my next action would be. I knew I wanted a divorce, and I kept my private investigator on the job to gather as much incriminating evidence as he could to make sure I could break clean without having to pay alimony. If anything, I'd take her to the cleaners. Over the next two weeks, the abdominal pains and chest pains began to increase in intensity and frequency. I considered an emergency room stop on multiple occasions, but I was confident the prognosis would be stress-related complications, so I opted to make an appointment with my regular doctor. Unfortunately, he didn't have an appointment available for two weeks, so I'd have to wait until then to hear him lecture me about reducing the stress in my life. Then something interesting happened. I decided to rummage through Amy's dresser drawers to see if I could find any evidence myself and came across something I wasn't expecting. A doll. It was a straw doll that had been dressed in snipped up fragments of my clothing, and the doll had enormous, intimidating pins sticking within the heart and stomach region of its anatomy. Was this a damn voodoo doll? It was then that I got a call from my private investigator. He informed me that he had collected enough intimate photographs of my wife and her lover to destroy her in divorce court. The PI also shared another tidbit of information that I found intriguing. Amy had been frequenting a small store named Bewitched. I paid a quick visit to the store and found that they provided everything that someone practicing voodoo could ever wish for. Amy wasn't satisfied with cheating on me. She wanted me dead. I had to hand it to her. She had a solid plan. She'd gradually kill me, allowing me ample time to complain of stomach and chest pains. 
When she finally ended my life, people would be surprised, but say the warning signs were there. Then Amy would inherit everything. Her and Joel would live happily ever after. I came home early from work one day and sat in the darkened corner of our bedroom. Amy entered the bedroom and she didn't notice me. This wasn't surprising, as I was never home at that time. I always worked late. That was my lone fault. The one that Amy thought I deserved to die for. I watched for several minutes as she removed one of her favorite dresses from her closet and inspected it as if she noticed something wrong with the garment. I know about the affair. Amy startled but regained her composure quickly. She stood stoically and stared at me with an icy gaze. It was the look of a murderess. I have all the proof I need. You won't be getting one dime from me. Amy smirked before she sprinted to the drawer to withdraw her secret weapon. She panicked and began rifling through the drawer when she couldn't find it. Looking for this? I held up the voodoo doll. The pins were gone, and my clothing had been removed from it. When she recognized that the doll was now dressed in the fabric from her favorite dress, she gasped. I didn't give her a chance to make any sudden moves or plea for mercy. I simply twisted the doll's head around and snapped it off. I'm a retired criminal defense attorney. In my day, I defended some of the meanest, most intimidating people in society. Thieves, kidnappers, carjackers, sexual deviants, arsonists, rapists, and of course, murderers. The scariest client I ever defended was a murderer, but he wasn't some hulking, heavily tattooed cretin. He was a good-looking young man in his late twenties. He was of average size, but was in very good shape. He had wavy blonde hair and pale blue eyes. He was also very intelligent. His name was Ellis Cole. The scariest thing about Mr. Cole was how detached he was. I never saw him display anger, fear, sadness, joy, or any other emotion. He was completely charmless. Not once did I see him crack the slightest of smiles. When I looked into his eerie eyes, I saw nothing. No spark, no conscience, no soul. Ellis Cole was a cash register repairman. He worked at several different stores in various locations. He was accused of butchering and killing four women. All four women worked at stores that Ellis Cole worked at. There are witnesses that say he asked two of them out and they declined due to his unsettling aura. Ellis had decent alibis for all four murders. Not rock solid, but decent. It was enough that the detectives on the case would have to come up with some serious evidence to put him away. And serious evidence they found. Blood that matched the blood type of one of his victims was found on his clothing. This was the late 1980s. DNA testing had not yet been established. Blood found on Ellis Cole's clothing that happened to match the same blood type of one of the victims would likely be enough to put him away for life or possibly send him to the electric chair. I hated being alone with Ellis Cole. He'd stare at me no matter what we were doing, and he wouldn't move. It was like sitting in the room with a damn mannequin. It was unnerving. When I told him of the evidence that was found, he replied immediately, They're lying. His voice was dry, monotone, and colorless. It matched his demeanor. With each word he uttered, a chill moved further down my spine. I want to make sure you understand that I'm not confessing to killing those women. All I'm saying is if I had killed them, I wouldn't have worn clothing while committing the act. 
I would have been completely naked, so as to make sure there was no chance of their blood staining my clothes. By the time he was finished, I was covered in goosebumps. He killed those girls. I had no doubt in my mind that he was guilty. And yet, it was my job to defend him to the best of my ability. And I did. Regretfully, I did. Obviously, the detectives on the case were convinced Ellis Cole was guilty, but knew they didn't have the evidence to put him away, so they manufactured it. The detectives wouldn't be dumb enough to obtain the blood to plant on Ellis's clothes from the crime lab. They'd have to sign in. They couldn't leave such obvious tracks, so I got my private investigator on the job. My P.I. found out that one of the detectives was dating a lab technician at a local hospital. He obtained video surveillance footage of the detective sneaking into the blood lab one day while visiting her. More than that, the video showed him leaving the room holding a small vial of blood. This was enough to create a shadow of doubt, and Ellis Cole was set free onto the world. I was relieved when I found out that Ellis Cole immediately moved out of the state, but I was frightened for whatever town that monster settled in. Who knows how many more victims he claimed over the years. That's something I have to live with. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to my channel now.